Good morning and welcome to session, what is this, 34, I think, on exploring uh, LDS history, where we are trying our best every week to look at the founding of the LDS Church in a way that's respectful and loving, in a way that is honest. It's so hard for us, I was thinking about this week, it's so hard for us, once we make up our mind that the way things are, that affects how we interpret the data, right? I don't know if you've, if you've ever had a conversation with someone who is an ardent atheist, and they have made up their mind, that's the way the world is, it doesn't matter how much evidence you give them, it's hard to convince them otherwise because of the way they view the data. To me, the existence of God is the most blatantly obvious thing in the world. For about a dozen different reasons, I look around and go, there has to be somebody behind all of this. And when we look at something like the history of the LDS Church, this, the same thing is true. If you approach the history of the church with the perspective and the belief that Joseph Smith is a prophet, that's going to affect how you look at everything. And the same thing is true, and I've tried to avoid this. If I, I obviously I, I don't believe Joseph Smith was a prophet that restored the true church on earth. I don't want the fat, that to taint how I look at it either. We're trying to just look at what actually happened in history and let the facts speak for themselves. And I'm trying my best to do so in a way that's respectful and loving. I want to always follow the encouragement of Scripture and I hope my speech comes across as gracious and loving. <coughs> and particularly today, as we continue to look at a very difficult subject, we started talking a few weeks ago about the practice of polygamy in this Nauvoo time period. And uh, we're going to get into this a lot deeper today. And um, here's how, what I want you to think about as we talk about some of these things that happened in Nauvoo. Um, the LDS Church today still believes um, they have to. Uh, if you go to their website, they still clearly state that we do believe polygamy was instituted by God for a time period that lasted, you know, from the time of Joseph Smith until about 1900 when God gave another revelation saying to stop practicing polygamy. But they have revelation recorded in their scripture um, saying to practice polygamy. So they, they acknowledge that all of this happened, and they then have to acknowledge that all of it they believe was from God, that God instituted this. So as we look at some of this today, I just want you to, to kind of weigh this polygamy that we're talking about. Because there's on the one hand, if, if, if Jesus showed up to this today and said, hey, you should all be practicing polygamy, Jesus really said that. I would obey, right? We would have to, right? We have to be obedient to our king. Um, that's supposedly what happened. Um, so as we look at some of this, just kind of weigh in your mind, does this sound like something God would have sanctioned? Does this sound like something that the God we read about in the Bible would have commanded his people to do? We'll just keep that in your mind as we look at some of this. Just real quick, we talked about a few weeks ago um, kind of the beginning stages in Joseph Smith's first couple wives. Um, it was all very hush-hush, very secret at the beginning. Uh, nearly all, even by 1843, after a few years, probably less than 200 people in Nauvoo knew that polygamy was going on. The vast majority of the church didn't know. Emma didn't know until probably 1843. And um, because it was all done in secret and because it was all so hush-hush, sometimes it can be hard to sort out when, what was happening when and what was happening where. Um, we talked about the fact that the first official wife that we know that every, all scholars, everybody can agree on, Smith married Louisa Beeman in 1841. By June of 1842, he'd been married or sealed to several other women most all of whom, most all of Joseph Smith's early wives were women who were already married to other men. And so we're going to kind of pick up there, and if you want some of the others, you can go back um, to the lesson from a couple weeks ago. 
So we'll start today. Let's talk about Zena Huntington Jacobs. The Huntington family had arrived in Nauvoo in 1839. And in 1840, Zena met and began to court a man named Henry Jacobs. And somewhere during their courtship, Smith had approached her and explained to her this principle of plural marriage and asked her to become one of his wives. And Zena was very conflicted, and so she declined Joseph Smith's proposal, and she married Henry instead in 1841. But within months of her marrying Henry, Smith came to her again with this message. He said, Joseph spent word to me by my brother. Her brother came to her and said, Joseph says, tell Zena, I put it off, and I put it off till an angel with a drawn sword stood by me and told me if I didn't establish that principle of plural marriage on the earth, I would lose my position and my life. So... And this, this tale circulates a lot with the early wives, both among the apostles and Joseph Smith. You've got to do this because an angel said he'll kill me if we don't. You see the kind of pressure that puts on poor Zena, who's already married. And if I remember correctly, pregnant at the time. And Joseph Smith says, I know, I know, you, I know you said no before. And I've tried to put it off. But the angel's going to kill me if I don't. And God had made it known to him she was to be his celestial wife. And you've got to remember, too, from the perspective of these ladies, Joseph's a prophet. What he says comes from God. So the kind of pressure that would put on you. She consented. She was married to Joseph Smith in October of 1842. These are her words. She said, When I heard that God had revealed the law of celestial marriage, I obtained a testimony for myself that God had required that order to be established in this church. I made a greater sacrifice than to give my life, for I never anticipated again to be looked upon as an honorable woman by those I dearly loved. So you can kind of see her mindset a little, right? I'm already married to this guy. Now I'm going to be married to another guy. And what on earth is everybody, what's, my, what's going to happen to my reputation right, when this gets out, when my family hears about this? What are they going to think about me? It was something too sacred to be talked about, and it was more to me than life or death, and I never breathed it for years. So she was married to Joseph Smith and didn't say anything. We do know Henry was aware of the marriage, her husband, and somehow he was convinced to remain faithful to the church because he believed whatever the prophet says must be right. So over the next several years, he was away on missions to Chicago, New York, and Tennessee, and you're going to see that theme over and over again today. The husband's off on a mission, and Smith's back home marrying his wife. Not long after Smith died, Zena married Brigham Young and became one of his plural wives, and um, in 1846, while Henry was on another mission in England, she began to openly live as Brigham Young's wife, and she lived with Brigham as his wife for the rest of her life. Henry struggled with that a bit, as you can imagine, um, but he remained faithful to the church despite all of that. And one point after she had started living, had left him, still married to him, but had left him to start living openly with Brigham, he wrote to her saying, the same affection is still there. I still love you. Right? You're my wife. I still love you, but I feel alone. I don't blame any person. May the Lord our Father bless Brother Brigham. All is right according to the law of the celestial kingdom of our God, of our God Joseph. So you can kind of see his mindset a little bit there. Not long after that, he married, Joseph married Zena's sister, Prescindia Huntington Buell. She was her older sister. Her and her husband had joined the church when the saints were in Kirtland in 1836. She married Smith in December of 1841, just a couple months after Zena. And after Smith's death, she married the apostle Heber C. Kimball. And it's interesting, Smith would eventually have 33, 34 wives, depending on how you count Fanny Alger. 
And when Smith dies, the apostles, and, I, and I'm not sure why, I need to dig into this some more, they gobble up all of his wives, and mostly Brigham Young I and mean Heber Kimball. Heber, I think, had 39 wives before it was all done. Um, they gobble up all of Smith's wives, and I'm not sure the reason for that. Some would say it was because they were concerned. That they, they wanted to make sure that they were all taken care of after he died. But I don't know how that works with this idea of, because some, they were sealed to Joseph Smith for eternity, but they're also sealed to Brigham Young or uh, Heber Kimball for eternity. And so I don't know doctrinally, I don't, under, I don't understand how all of that works, but, but it's what happened. Uh, most of his wives ended up, or many of them, I shouldn't say most, probably two-thirds ended up married to Brigham Young or Heber Kimball or one of the other apostles. Anyway, Prescindia eventually left her first husband, Norman, and her 16-year-old son when the saints came to Utah. She left to move to Utah, taking their six-year-old son with them. And at the time, her husband, uh, Norman, was apparently still unaware that she was had been married to Joseph Smith or Heber Kimball. He sent her a letter when they had, were in winter camp in Nebraska waiting to finish the move to Utah, offering to, if you can just hang on till I settle affairs here, you know, I'll join you there and I'll come to Utah with you. And she declined and um, remained with Heber. We could talk about Agnes Coolberth, Coolbrith Smith. This one's very interesting. So um, she was baptized in Kirtland and for a while lived with Joseph and Emma. She eventually married Joseph Smith's brother, Don Carlos, in 1835. Uh, but then Don Carlos died of malaria in the summer of 1841. Five months later, she was married to Joseph Smith which part of me goes just on a purely, purely practical level. I don't really mean this as a joke, but Ooh, right? It's your brother's wife. Um, that's creepy. Uh, but they were married in January of 1842. Brigham Young recorded in his um, journal on that day in a coded Masonic code. I was taken into the lodge. J. Smith was Agnes and was, W-A-S is an acronym, stands for was wedded and sealed. Married and sealed to Agnes. Joseph's journal on that same day kind of gives an insight into his thinking about where all of this was going. He said, truly this is a day long to be remembered by the saints of the last days, a day in which the God of heaven has begun to restore the ancient order of his kingdom. And kind of his thinking on the subject is, you know, we're restoring this practice of plural marriage, we're restoring things. God's kingdom to the way God intended it to be. Later that spring, at a meeting of the Relief Society, the women's organization, Emma, who was the head of the Relief Society, announced that a woman named Cl Clarissa Marvel was accused of telling scandalous falsehoods on the character of President Joseph Smith. Remember, this is all secret, secret, hush, hush. Very few people know, but somebody's spreading rumors about President Smith. So they launched a full investigation, and a few days later, Clarissa signed this statement, where she signed an affidavit saying, This is to certify that I never have at any time or place seen or heard anything improper or unvirtuous in the conduct of conversation of either President Smith or Mrs. Agnes Smith. So that would lead you to believe, if you put all of that together, the rumors that she was accused of spreading must have had something to do with something improper between Joseph and Agnes. Does that make sense? Because a few days later, she's saying, nope, I never said anything, right? I never, it wasn't me. I don't know who was telling it, but it wasn't me. So it, it looks like maybe there was rumors getting around because by this point, they had already been married for several months. Following Smith's death, Agnes married... Uh, Joe and Don Carlos's cousin, George Albert Smith. But she didn't follow the saints to Utah. She didn't stay with him, and she eventually married a fourth husband, and she left her Mormon life behind. And many, many years later, she wrote to her nephew, 
uh, Joseph F. Smith, that was Hiram's son, who by then was a leader and apostle in the church and would go on to become the president of the church. Um, she, many years later, she wrote back to him in Utah saying, I acknowledge none greater than those that belong to the household of Joseph, our dear, dear departed one Joseph. I could say many things to you that I know and that has been told to me by those that are dead and gone, but perhaps you would not believe me. No, I know that you would not, so it's best for me to keep silent. And so you kind of see that theme popping up over and over again, too, where even many, many years later, some of these women are saying, I know a whole lot of stuff, but it's probably better if I don't talk about it. Talk about Sylvia Sessions Lyons. Well, Sylvia and her husband, Windsor, joined the saints in Nauvoo in 1839. She was sealed to Smith in February of 1842, and it's not clear whether Windsor, her husband, knew about it or not. We do know he was excommunicated in November of that year for suing a state president for lack of payment on a debt that he owed. So he was excommunicated and didn't come back to the church until 1846. And in that period of years in between, um, she, Sylvia gave birth to her only surviving child, a little girl named Josephine. Windsor comes back into the church in 1846, and they remain together as husband and wife. They eventually moved to Utah and um, raised Josephine there. So in 1882, on her deathbed, Sylvia made this revelation to Josephine. Just prior to my mother's death in 1882, she called me to her bedside and told me her days were numbered, and before she passed away from mortality, she desired to tell me something which she had kept as an entire secret from me and from all others, but which she now desired to communicate to me. She told me that I was the daughter of Prophet Joseph Smith. And so for many years, that testimony was all we had because we couldn't do DNA testing, but we can, you know, that work has been done on her descendants now. And it seems like the DNA evidence proves that Joseph wasn't the dad. But still leaves you with the question, why did Sylvia think he was? And one thing that we talked about at the beginning, if, if, uh, if you believe Joseph Smith was a prophet and God was ordering him to do these things, you have to explain his actions. And one thing a lot, a lot would say today, well, he was sealed to these women, but it was for eternity and there was no physical relationship, right, um, that was involved. It was just a ceiling in eternity, but, but not for time. They didn't have any relationship in this life. And it certainly seems like with a lot of these women that was not the case. Couldn't have been the case with Sylvia if she was convinced that Joseph was the father of her child, right? <clears throat> Mary Rollins Leitner. Her family joined the saints in Kirtland when she was just 12 years old, and she wrote later, remembering the very first time she met Joseph Smith when she was just 12. She said, when he saw me, he looked at me so earnestly, I felt almost afraid, and I thought, he can read my every thought. And I thought how blue his eyes were. And after a moment or two, he came and put his hands on my head and gave me a great blessing, the first I ever received." You can see, even as a little kid, how she looks up at Joseph Smith here on a pedestal. That fall, her family left Kirtland trying to be obedient to the prophet's command to go and populate Zion, so they headed for Missouri, and they settled there. And she didn't have contact with Joseph Smith again until 1834 when he came to Missouri as part of Zion's camp, if you remember back that far in our study. And so... It, he told her in 1834, he said he was commanded to take her for his wife. But there was a thousand miles between them when he was in Ohio, and he said he just got afraid to do so. So in 1835, she must have thought it was never going to happen. She married Adam Leitner. But by 1840, they'd been run out of Missouri, and she and Adam had settled in Nauvoo and were raising two kids already there. In 1842, he approached her again about being his wife and told her, The angel came to me three times between the year of 1834 and 42. Here's our angel again. And said I was to obey that principle or he would slay me. I know I will be saved in the kingdom of God. 
I have the oath of God upon it, and God cannot lie. All that he gives me, I will take with me. For I have that authority, authority and power conferred upon me. So you see what he's doing here. And this pops up again with the other women too. An angel told me I have to do it or they're going to kill me. And he's tying her salvation to it, right? Right? I have the ability to take you into the celestial kingdom with me. Don't you want to be a part of the celestial kingdom? Right? I'm going. Uh, They told me for sure I'm going. The angel said, I've got that authority if you want to go too, don't you? And so for somebody that you look to as a religious authority, this this puts an enormous amount of pressure on these women. And again, I ask, if God was going to institute polygamy, is this the way he would do it? Is this the way the God we read about in the Bible would go about this? She still put him off, saying she needed a sign from God from herself. We could go on. She eventually, she's praying. She saw an angel in her bedroom, and she consented. They were sealed by Brigham Young. It's not clear if her husband was aware, but we do know he was away when they were um, sealed to each other. She continued to live with her first husband for the rest of her life, despite also being sealed to Brigham Young after Joseph Smith died. And many years later, she wrote, I could tell you why I stayed with Mr. Leitner, her first husband, things the current leaders of the church don't know anything about. I did just as Joseph told me to do. I love to talk about the prophet in the early days of the church, and I will always remember how Joseph looked at that first ceiling when she was 12. He was tall and of a commanding figure, full of life. Yes, I could tell you many things that I cannot write, but I remember every word he ever said to me. So she stayed in the church and stayed faithful. Miranda Johnson Hyde is interesting because that last name might sound familiar if you've been paying attention. She was married to Orson Hyde, who was very early on called to be one of the 12 apostles. And in 1840, he was sent on a mission to Palestine to consecrate the Holy Land for the great gathering of Judah in the last days. And that mission would take him away for three years. While he was away, he left Miranda with, I believe, two kids at the time living in abject poverty. She wrote about being in a tiny little cabin with no windows, no food to eat, just really destitute. And so in December of 1841, Smith received a revelation regarding her care. Verily thus saith the Lord unto my servant Joseph, inasmuch as you have called upon me to know my will concerning my handmaid Nancy Miranda Hyde. Behold, it is my will that she should have a better place prepared for her than that which she now lives, in order that her life may be spared unto her. And this wasn't a place with Joseph Smith. They made arrangements for another family to take her and the kids in and take care of them. But Smith's making provisions for her care, right? And let my handmaid Nancy Miranda Hyde hearken to the counsel of my servant Joseph in all things, whatever he will teach unto her. In a lot of these early writings about polygamy, it's even in writing they're cryptic. They never say, listen to them when they teach you this new doctrine of polygamy. It's listen to whatever they teach you. They're cryptic about it even then. But if you listen to him, it'll be a blessing upon her and her children after her. In the spring of that following year, Miranda and Smith were married. And it's not known when and if Orson was brought in, that if he was aware at the time, or if he had his blessing, he was away a long time to communicate with Palestine in 1840 time frame, right? So we don't know when he knew and what he knew, but we do know that when he got back, Smith brought him into the fold. He was one of the very first people to, to bring in on this new doctrine of polygamy. He was brought in. He began practicing polygamy. He would eventually take seven additional wives, and Miranda would eventually divorce him in Utah in 1870 because he was paying so much attention to his younger wives. And the real difficulty of polygamy in practice, there's a lot of great books out there. If you want to go read books from people, first-hand accounts of, from women inside of polygamous um, communes and uh, whatnot, that it just creates this almost, it's a burden on the husband and the wife in that 
it creates this atmosphere of jealousy, right? If you've got three or four wives, which one is he favoring, right? And who's he sleeping with tonight? And how come he doesn't pay any attention to me anymore? And how come, you know, she got $25 this week and she got 50 or, you know, whatever. It's just this whole, it sets up this whole competitive um, kind of thing. And so she ended up leaving him. This one to me is really sad. Helen Mar Kimball. Just think about this as a parent. And so the picture on the left is a picture, an actual picture of Helen later in life. The picture on the right is a picture that has been digitally altered to show what she might have looked at like when she was 14, because that's when this story takes place. So in 1843, Heber Kimball, one of the apostles, had this conversation with Helen, his daughter, who at the time was 14 years old. Without any preliminaries, my father asked me if I would believe him if he told me that it was right for married men to take other wives. The first impulse was anger. My sensibilities were painfully touched. I felt such a sense of personal injury and displeasure. For to mention such a thing to me, I thought altogether unworthy of my father. And as quick as he spoke, I replied to him short and emphatically, no, I wouldn't. This was the first time I ever openly manifested anger towards him. Then he commenced talking seriously and reasoned and explained the principle of plural marriage and why it was again to be established upon this earth. This had a similar effect to a sudden shock of a small earthquake. Turns out that Heber and Joseph had already been discussing the prospect of Helen becoming one of his wives. Um, having a great desire to be connected with the prophet Joseph, dad offered me to him. This I afterwards learned about from the prophet's own mouth. My father, this is such a sad statement. My father had but one ewe lamb, but he willingly laid her upon the altar. That's heartbreaking, isn't it? And um, I don't know all the intentions here that in Heber's mind, if this is, you know, he's sealed to his daughter and that's going to give us a connection in the afterlife, it'll keep me closer to Smith and maybe it'll keep me closer in his, in his good graces. Now, I don't know all of, the, all of Heber's motivations there, but he willingly gave his 14-year-old daughter to Smith as one of his wives. The next morning, Smith visited the Kimball home himself now, imagine you're a 14 year old. This is your prophet, right? The, the man you probably look up to more than anybody else on earth, except maybe your dad, who's part of it. And she said, He explained the principle of celestial marriage, after which he said to me, If you will take this step, it will ensure your eternal salvation and exaltation and that of your father's household and all of your kindred. That's a lot of pressure to put on a 14 year old girl, isn't it? If you'll just do this, you and your family can be saved one day. This promise was so great that I willingly gave myself to purchase so glorious a reward. Uh, listen, you can say whatever you want about what the church might believe today. But does this sound like salvation by grace? Right? Right? Smith is tying the salvation of her family to her willingness to be, take him as a wife. That's not grace. In fact, that's a pretty harsh work for God to ask you to do <laughs> in order to be saved. None but God and his angels could see my mother's bleeding heart when Joseph asked her if she was willing. Think about her poor mama. She had witnessed the suffering of others because she was in the loop who were older and who better understood the step they were taking. And to see her child, who had scarcely seen her 15th summer, following in the same thorny path, in her mind she saw the misery which was sure to come, but it was all hidden to me. That's such a sad statement. But Helen's mom agreed, and in May of 1843, Helen married Joseph Smith. In June of 1844, the next summer, um, so she'd have been 15, maybe just turned 16, Heber was away on a mission, and he wrote back to Helen, and he said, My dear daughter, be obedient to the counsel you have given, 
you have given to you. If you should be tempted or having feelings in your heart, tell them to no one but your father and mother. If you do, you will be betrayed and exposed. I don't know what he has in mind here, but it sounds like you've got to keep it all quiet. If you're having any problems with this, don't say anything, right? Except to your mom. Don't talk to anybody. You are blessed, but you know it not. I would want to say, uh, maybe I shouldn't say. This sounds like grooming, doesn't it? That's the kind of things pedophiles say when they're grooming somebody. You're blessed, but you don't know it. You've done that which will be for your everlasting good for this world and that which is to come. I'll admit there's not much pleasure in this world. Be true to the covenants that you have made. Be a good girl. Your affectionate father. Now, to me, that sounds like a father writing to his daughter who's wrestling with something more than I was just sealed for eternity. Right? If all of these marriages where you're just sealed for eternity and you're 14, you go to the ceremony and it's over, right? That's it. You go about your life. Big deal. That doesn't sound like what was going on in any of these, does it? There's something more than, yeah, we went and had a ceremony that one day I'll be with Joseph Smith in eternity. Sounds to me like there was more than that going on. We could go on, and I, I started with this intention, and it's just too much. <laughs> I couldn't do it. 34 t wives in total. That gives you a flavor of some of them. You can see most all of the early wives before, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but before Emma became aware, most of his wives were, marriages were to women who were already married, who had husbands. And then later it became uh, more single women, three sets of sisters that he married, one mother-daughter combination that he married. Um, you can see one, two, three, seven girls that were under the 17 or younger uh, at the time of, his, of their marriage. So that gives you kind of a flavor of the way these were going down. I'll mention a couple more as we move along in a little bit. So very early on, Hiram, Brigham, Heber, and a few others were brought into this system. And it seems to me that he brought in people that he thought he could get on board because it wasn't all of his leaders. Signy Rigdon didn't know for a long time, and he was his first counselor because he knew he was strongly opposed to polygamy. So they kept him in the dark, kept some of his other leaders that seems to me that he knew would be not get on board were kept in the dark. But very early on, some of his leaders were brought in, and most of them, they told their wives, they won them over with surprisingly very little argument. Uh, one that they didn't win over was Don Carlos, Joe's brother, who fought it initially. Um, prior to his death in 1841, he said, any man who will preach and practice spiritual wifery will go to hell no matter if it is my brother Joseph. William Smith, on the other hand, was all about it, and he was an eager convert, and he took four additional wives by 1845. The interesting thing in all, all of this to me, though, is how on earth did they ever get the women on board? And most of them, without, without a big fight, there would be a big fight eventually with Emma, but it was a long time before Emma found out. But most of these other men, they were able to get their wives on board. How did they do it? I know if I went to my wife today after 27 years of marriage and I said, hey, hon, I was just at church and Bobby was telling me, he's had this revelation from God that I know this is going to be hard to hear, but our salvation's tied to it, right? We, we have to, God says, we, I, I have to take more wives. I really don't want to do it. But God said, right? I can tell you that conversation would not go well. But somehow they were able to convince uh, the women in Nauvoo, it seems like without a whole lot of effort. And so scholars have wrestled with how is that possible? How were they able to do that? And there's several things they, they point to um, that are possibilities. And I don't, I don't really know the answer. But some of the possibilities are Nauvoo was a town full of church widows because there was a whole lot of men off on missions for two or three years at a time. And so maybe that played into some of this, especially with a lot of these early wives who already had husbands, right? Um, that played into it. 
There were also the problem of Nauvoo was a city full of separated but not divorced women who had converted and left their husbands who didn't convert, right? They'd left their husbands and moved to Nauvoo. And a lot of those women just needed stability and income, right? And some sort of st stability to survive. So that might have played into it. Um, that doesn't explain, and I'm not sure the answer to this, why any available single woman would agree to be, any eligible 18-year-old would be agree to be the third or sixth or tenth wife uh, of another man. Um, because like any, the problem all across the frontier was a lack of women, right? Almost all frontier towns, the men outnumbered the women two to one. That's how mail order brides and stuff got to be a thing. There wasn't enough ladies. And so that was a problem everywhere. Um, and so I go, it has to go, and, and maybe it's the, the, the religious mindset that goes into it too, that I'm just so convinced that Joseph Smith is a prophet and we just have to do whatever they say. And they, they sold it, you know, as a great honor or whatever. They built it up to where it sounds far more attractive than we're making it sound today or it would be in our mind. But whatever the case, um, most of the wives got on board with it. Initially, the number of first wives that knew, which first wives is the term that developed for, guess what, the first wife, right? Uh, they got on board, but the numbers who knew about it were initially very small, and the ones who did were in on the secret and persuaded to keep it quiet. But man, it's hard to keep a secret. And rumors began to circulate, and there were women showing up pregnant who didn't have fathers, and that requires some explaining. And so the Relief Society, who was led by Emma and Elizabeth Whitney, and just notice these names, Elizabeth Whitney, Sarah Cleveland, Elvira Cowles, and Eliza Snow, they began to grill every new woman who came into the church, right? We are going to clean up this town and all this, whatever's going on. Smith publicly praised them for their zeal, but warned they have to be very careful in your examinations or the consequences could be serious. And eventually, every one of those women who were leading the Relief Society became one of Smith's plural wives all without Emma knowing. The only exception was Mrs. Whitney, who instead gave Smith her 17-year-old daughter, Sarah, to marry. Sarah's father, Newell Whitney, you might recognize that name. He was, he's come up quite a bit in our story. He was given this revelation through Joseph Smith, authorizing the marriage to his daughter, who was 17 at the time. Verily, thus saith the Lord unto my servant, N.K. Whitney, the thing that my servant Joseph Smith has made known unto you and your family and what you have agreed upon is right in my eyes. And again, notice it doesn't say polygamy. This, this thing that he's told you about, you know what I'm talking about, right? but they don't come out and say the words. Um, it's right in my eyes and will be rewarded upon your heads with honor and immortality and eternal life to all of your house, both old and young. So again, tying their salvation and their eternal destiny to getting on board with this. Sarah's mom said, We were convinced in our own minds that God approved, and we were willing to give our eldest daughter, then only 17 years of age, to Joseph in plural marriage. A few weeks later, now just tell me what this sounds like to you. A few weeks later, Smith, who was also hiding from the law, in this whole time period, in the view, he occasionally had warrants. Remember, he still wanted in Missouri, and that still comes up from time to time. And so he's dodging a warrant or somebody that um, showed up looking for him. So he's hiding from the law in a house just outside of Novo, and he wrote this letter to Sarah. My feelings are so strong for you since what has passed lately between us. It seems if I could not live long in this way, and if you three would come and see me, it would afford me great relief. I know it's the will of God that you should comfort me now in this time of affliction. The only thing to be careful of is find out when Emma's coming. Because then you can, you, if she's here, you cannot be safe. But when she is not here, there is the most perfect safety. Burn this letter as soon as you read it. Keep all locked up in your breasts. 
You will pardon me for my earnestness on this subject when you consider how lonesome I must be. I think Emma won't come tonight. If she don't come, don't fail to come tonight. What's it sound like Joseph's wanting to see her for? Comfort. <laughs> the reason I say that is I read some modern LDS accounts on this today. They want to say, well, the letter was addressed to his family, and he just wanted them to come so they could um, partake of the ordinances together. Does that sound like a guy who's, it would really come for me right now if we could, you could come and we could have communion, right? If we could take the sacrament, that's, that's why I need you to be here tonight. That doesn't seem to me like what he was wanting her to visit him for. And if that was the case, why would you care if Emma was there or not? You could all take the sacraments together. So bringing influential women into it, that might have been intended to assist in keeping polygamy secret. A lot of times they would use these women who are in to kind to break the news to the future plural wife, right? They would send one of the women to them to go, this is going to be hard to hear, but there's this new thing. It was hard for me to hear at first too, but, right? So they, they used them in that way. But man, secrets are hard to keep. And the first time word really got out was in 1842. Brigham Young had set his eyes on a young lady who was 18 named Martha Brotherton, whose family had just arrived in Nauvoo. He took her to the room above Joseph Smith's store. You might remember I showed you a picture of the old brick store a couple weeks ago. Took her to that room above the store, locked the door, and proceeded to have the following conversation with Martha. Brother Joseph has had a revelation from God that it is lawful and right for a man to have two wives. If you will accept it of me, I will take you straight to the celestial kingdom. And he's learning from his boss, right? Same line. You can go right to the celestial kingdom when you die. If you will have me in this world, he's not talking about sealing for eternity. If you'll have me in this world, I will have you in that which is to come. And Brother Joseph will marry us here today. And you can go home this evening, and your parents won't have to know anything about what's going to happen. That doesn't sound like on the up and up. Not even asking her dad's hand. Martha said, I need some time to think about this. And so Brigham called Smith in, who said, you need to decide right now. Here's what Smith said. Just go ahead and do as Brigham wants you. He says this kind of jokingly. He's the best man in the world except for me. If you will accept of Brigham, you will be blessed. God shall bless you. My blessing will rest upon you. And if you don't like it in a month or two, come to me. I'll make you free again. And if he turns you off, I'll take you in. That's nice, right? She said, but sir, it'll be too late to think about it in a month or two. I want time to think first. And Smith said, but the old proverb is, hey, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Long story short, Martha stuck her guns and refused. I eventually let her go, but she did not keep quiet. She went home, immediately wrote down everything that was said, and told her parents, good girl. They left Nauvoo very shortly thereafter for St. Louis. Their family said, what do we got ourselves into? We're out of here. But not before they told that story to as many people in Nauvoo as they could tell. And so word got out, and uh, they, it was eventually published in the newspaper in St. Louis, and that story was picked up by new, other newspapers and ran all over the country. And so word's out for the first time outside of Nauvoo, and so Smith and the apostles had to quickly kind of go into spin mode to put a lid on all of this. At the April General Conference, Hiram took the stand and contradicted the report that a sister had been shut in a room for several days and they'd endeavored to induce her to believe in having two wives. I don't, they did not have her shut up for several days. Um, the 12 apostles all testified to Joseph's principles that they were nothing but virtuous, and Joseph himself delivered a blistering sermon against fornication and adultery and those who were using his name to sanction their sin. Part of what he said in that sermon was, We have among us thieves and adulterers, liars and hypocrites, if God should speak from heaven, he would command you not to steal, not to commit adultery, not to covet, nor to deceive. 
Now, in Smith's mind, I think he could justify this because I think in his mind he would say, I'm not committing adultery, right? I'm practicing celestial marriage. And all you have to do is redefine the terms, and in his mind he can say, that's true. But I don't know how he could say he wasn't deceiving his own people at this point in time because most of, they were all still in the dark about what was going on with polygamy except for by this point in time, maybe 200 people at most, and there's 10,000 saints living in Nauvoo, right? I don't know how he could not think he was deceiving them. So, I think we can do this. I'm trying to decide. You got 10 minutes? All right. Also, in this same time, let's not forget John Cook Bennett. He's Joseph Smith's right-hand man. You might remember for a couple of weeks ago, he'd come in to Nauvoo, help him get their city charter. He was number two in the Nauvoo Legion, number two in the church, and was a rascal. And people had learned by this time he was a rascal. He was a serial fornicator, sleeping with as many possible women as he could. And for Bennett, he might sometimes use the pretense of celestial marriage and sometimes not, right? Um, he didn't need the doctrinal sanction to cover up what he was doing. He was also power hungry, and Smith began to get really nervous that he had his eyes on his job. Uh, he even thought at one point that he had plotted to have Smith accidentally shot while the Legion was drilling one day uh, because they were both eyeing the same girl. Turns out it was Nancy Rigdon, Sidney's daughter. Sidney does not know about plural marriage at this point. They both had their eyes on Nancy, who was 19 at the time. According to Nancy's brother, the courtship went like this, that they'd gone to church one day and uh, Miranda Hyde, uh, Orson's wife, also Joseph's wife, right, had invited her to the house and sat her down and they got comfortable and she explained to her all about plural marriage. Um, Nancy was surprised to hear it. Or Miranda said, I was shocked as you are. I know it's a lot, but it's the thing. While they were talking, Smith happened to show up and he joined them and uh, Hyde immediately left the room. It was then that Joseph made the proposal of marriage to my sister. Nancy flatly refused him, saying if she ever got married, she would marry a single man or none at all. And she took her bonnet and she went home, leaving Joseph at the lady's house. Nancy also went home and, um, well, before that, Joseph made the mistake of writing Nancy a letter the next day. And this is the first time we ever see his thoughts on polygamy put down on paper. She says no, and he writes to her later to say, hey, hey, Nancy, let me explain why this is important. Happiness is the object and design of our existence. I disagree with that from a theological perspective, right? But I'll grant it for now, right? I don't think that's the purpose of our existence. Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, and faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. But we can't keep all the commandments without first knowing them, right? So he's going, we have to keep God's commandments to be happy, but how can you keep them if you don't know them? I'm just trying to tell you God's commandments, one of which is polygamy, right? This new doctrine that you're having a hard time with. Whatever God requires is right, no matter what it is, although we may not see the reason thereof till long after the events transpire. If we seek first the kingdom of God, all good things will be added. So with Solomon. First he asked wisdom, and God gave it to him, and with it every desire of his heart, right? Solomon obeyed God, and God gave him a thousand wives. And so that's kind of the argument he's making. You, I know this is hard, but man, we have to be obedient. Nancy showed the letter to Signy, who threw a fit. This is the first he's ever heard about polygamy, is his daughter coming to him, saying, Joseph propositioned me to marry him. So he confronted Smith, who initially denied everything until Sidney pulled out the letter and said, what about this? At which point, Smith, still trying to backpedal, said, oh, I just did that. I was just testing her virtue, right? And so he's in spin mode. Sidney's mad. 
they'll eventually patch it up. Things are not the same, but they will eventually, Sydney doesn't leave, they patch things up. The point for now, though, is that word got out about Smith proposing to Nancy and uh, his refusal. So now that rumor, he's just recovering from the, the, um, the one from Martha Brotherton, right? I'm just getting the public image back, and now here's this new bombshell. And Bennett was likely the source of a lot of the talk. And so in this time period, there's a lot, and I didn't have time to go into all the detail. This whole summer of 1842, uh, all of Bennett's actions are coming to the light and what a scoundrel he is, and all of that's coming up, and they kind of patch it up, and he's making accusations against Smith, and Smith has him apologize to the city council, and then they're better, and then they're fighting, and it's just, it's a mess for the whole summer. Um, he eventually has Bennett excommunicated at the end of all of that. And for Smith, it was weighing, is he more dangerous for me to keep him close or is it more dangerous if I let him go, right? That's what he's, if I let him loose and he starts talking, I'm in big trouble. So he tried to keep him close, but he eventually, it got so bad, he's like, I, you know, I'm going to have to cut him loose and just deal, let the chips fall where they may. So they excommunicate Bennett and Bennett immediately writes a series of scathing tell-all letters to the Sangamo Journal. They got picked up and ran all over the country. And I mean, they are brutal. He tells everything. And most of what he tells is not even true. I mean, he's just, I mean, he is, his intent is to tear Joseph a new one, and he succeeds. I'll give you just a couple of excerpts from some of these letters, just so you kind of get the flavor. Here's his first thing. He says, on the 17th of May in 1842, Joe Smith requested to see me alone in the preparation room of the Nauvoo Lodge on some important business. We entered, he locked the door, put the key in his pocket, drew a pistol on me and said, the peace of my family requires that you should sign an affidavit and make a statement before the next city council on the 19th exonerating me from all participation, whatever, whatever, either directly or indirectly, in word or deed, in spiritual wife doctrine or private intercourse with females in general. And if you do not do it with apparent cheerfulness, I will make um, fish bait of you and deliver you to the Danites for execution tonight. Now, here's the thing. That never happened. But he had convinced Bennett to make a statement before the city council saying Smith's not doing any of this stuff, right? So he's enlarging the story, but he's doing it in a way to make himself look good. And in all these letters, Bennett comes out looking rosy like a spotless lamb. Um, so it's hard in all of this to decide. It's hard to figure out fact from fiction. He said, I'll tell you... Um, he replied, I tell you, as I was once told, your die is cast, your fate is fixed, your doom is sealed. If you refuse, will you do it or die? I remarked that I would under the circumstance, I would under the circumstances, but that it was hard to take the advantage of an unarmed man. If you tell that publicly, he said, death is your portion. Remember the Danites, right? That doesn't sound like a real conversation. Probably a conversation that never happened. He also said this about Miss Pratt. Orson Pratt's wife, one of the apostles, wife of Professor Pratt, uh, Joe Smith stated to me in an early day in the history of that city that he intended to, to, take, to make that amiable and accomplished lady one of his spiritual wives, for the Lord had given her to him, and he requested me to assist him in consummating his hellish purposes, like I had nothing to do with any of this all along. But I told him that I would not do it, that she had been much neglected and abused by the church during the absence of her husband in Europe, and that if the Lord had given her to him, he must attend to it himself. I will do it, said he, for there's no harm in it if her husband should never find out. Well, these kind of accusations that he is making, right? And Orson had been away. And there, there were rumors that Smith had a relationship with her. There was rumors that it had been her and Bennett, right? This, all this kind of stuff's flying around. Um. I'll try to pick this one up in the middle for the sake of time. Um, Smith says, I know I am a prophet. Yes, and Pratt and Rigdon and Robinson and Hyde Hughes and Marks and hundreds of others know you are a liar, Joe. And Pratt and others have told you so in the face of open day. You lied in the name of the Lord. Remember that, you base blasphemer. Remember that and weep. 
Look at your black catalog of crimes, your seductions and attempted seductions in the name of your maker, your thefts, your robberies, your murders. Why Satan blushes to behold so corrupt and loathsome a mortal, right? And so it's that kind of invective that just goes on and on and on over a period of weeks and letter and letter after letter that are getting published everywhere. So by the end of all of that, by the time Bennett's finished with Nauvoo, it was synonymous with Sodom and Gomorrah. Everything that he said was going on there. Uh, and in the end of it all, he said, well, I really only joined the Mormons to expose them in the first place. And so it's a total cover his own hide thing. But the problem is some of what he says is true. He, in all of his letters, he has affidavits from all these women who say, I was Joseph Smith's spiritual wife, and I did marry Joseph Smith and uh, signs testimonies from people. But it's so over the top, and it's so obvious he's never done anything wrong in his life when you read it. And I had no part to play. I was just such an innocent lamb that it's easy to see through uh, some of his BS on this. He so overstated his case that it added, actually made it easier for Smith to discredit him in the eyes of the Mormons. And so... He gets into this back and forth where Smith has published his own series of affidavits countering the ones that Bennett did, and it's just a mess, and it's hard to follow uh, all of the who said, he said, she said, whatever, fallout from this. The, the negative downfall from Smith's point in all of this, though, is it forced Smith to keep polygamy a secret right at the moment he was intending to make it public, Right? He's trying to come forward and forward and forward with it, but in light of all of this backlash about polygamy from the public, it forces him to keep it quiet even longer. And so Smith persuaded dozens of prominent elders to swear publicly that the only conventional going on in marriage, marriage in Nauvoo was conventional marriage, even though some of them knew it wasn't true. A similar statement was signed by a dozen prominent Mormon women with Emma's name right at the top. And at the time, Emma could do that with a clear conscience. I don't think she did know yet. But some of the other women signing that statement had been married to Joseph Smith for quite some time. At the same time, they're signing a statement saying, no, there's only conventional normal marriage going on here. There's no polygamy going on here. Um, so they are forced to continue denying polygamy. And in fact, Mormon leaders would deny polygamy even though it became more and more widespread, they wouldn't officially recognize it until 1852 that it was going on in the church. Now, if God sanctioned it and ordered you to do it, boy, this is a lot of work to keep it quiet, isn't it? And I think they kind of, they deny, 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 deny polygamy or spiritual wifery. And again, how do you keep lying with a clear conscience? You go, well, we're not pra practicing polygamy. We're practicing celestial marriage. We're not practicing spiritual wifery. We're practicing the patriarchal order of marriage. Totally different, right? It's kind of one of those things. But you knew what I meant, right, when I asked you if you were a polygamist? Well, you didn't ask me if I was a celestial marriageist, right? And so that kind of, I think, allowed them with a clear conscience to just keep denying, 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 denying while at the same time the practice continued to grow and to grow and to grow. Lots more could be said about that. Lots, lots more if we took the time to tell the stories of all 33 of those women. But I think that gives you a flavor for how polygamy uh, was started and how that doctrine developed in Nauvoo. Um, I'll leave you to wrestle with that sounds like something that was from God or not. The other thing is all of this the sensation that came out when all of this hit, uh, hit the public mind for the first time. It also sets in wheels the motion in motion for the events that will ultimately lead to Joseph Smith's death in 1844, which, God willing, we'll talk about next week. So let's pray, and I'll answer any questions you might have.